There we go. Okay, Marina, when you're ready, I will mute myself. Um, you're on mute at the moment, so you'll need to unmute to get going. And over to you. Can't hear you at the moment, Marina. I think it's still on mute. Okay, good morning. <laughs> So um, I've prepared a presentation about attendance. The DfE have brought some new guidance in for schools, which isn't yet statutory. So if I work my way through and I'll look out for your questions, maybe I'll pick them up uh, throughout the presentation or wait till the end. But I hope to cover as much as I could from cases I've been working on, as well as the, the guidance here. To, to support you. So hopefully you'll find this useful. So as I just said, the, the guidance isn't going to be statutory until 2023, September. So let's see what's changed. It's much more of a support first um, process now. So the expectations are that schools will be looking at data, they'll be trying to identify where problems are happening and be working with the family first before problems really escalate. So if there's a reason that you know of why it's become problematic for your child to go to school, we'll be looking at that in a moment. But there'll be targeted whole family support. And there are teams that can become involved that will help with education planning meetings, with the school, trying to work out strategies that might help you to, well, and your child or young person to get to school. And a big change is that independent schools, their data will also be collected and they'll receive the same support um, from the LAs as other schools, which is, is different. So the barriers to attendance, um, we get lots of calls about children that are out of school. And there's such a wide variety of reasons. So some of the examples are mental health issues, including anxiety, which has been particularly difficult for many children. Um, special educational needs that may not have yet been identified yeah. is also okay. coming up as an issue. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes family issues. Sarah, I can hear some feedback. The um, Equality Act is clear that schools have a duty to make some reasonable adjustments. So if your child has a disability, which means a long term um, impairment that's physical or mental, and it's got a substantial effect on, on in the long term, um, affecting their day to day activities, that there are adjustments that the school can make and there is guidance around that if if you're unsure so sometimes there are medical issues if you have got reports from a professional that explains that it's a long-term illness or a chronic condition such as asthma that can be used in evidence that i'm going to discuss in a minute there is um, an nhs link um, is my child too ill for school I've got a link here but I haven't put it in the presentation so I'll try and drop that in the chat at some point but it is a, um, a defense if you're charged with non-attendance that if there is a, a reasonable justification that can be used to uh, hold the the attendance order um, as I said about anxiety, it's become much more evident um, more recently. And emotionally based school avoidance is a particular um, thing that we've seen. And there is guidance in schools, guidance for schools and for parents. And there is a link here in the slide for you to look at. And it describes how the school can work with you. So sometimes, School, refuse, use, uh, school refusal is known as school phobia, and it's sometimes temporary. 
But for some children and young people, it can become much more serious and they're out of school for a long time. So when you're looking um, at your child or young person's attendance, are you seeing a, a unauthorised attendances that you didn't know about, particularly for the older children that may be walking to school themselves? Are they not arriving at school? You know, is, is the school contacting you and you were unaware that they weren't actually at school? Have you noticed um, changes in the mood or behaviour or has the school noticed this? Is there something behind that that you're unaware of at the moment? And, you know, don't jump to conclusions. It might not be a problem that you know about, but try and talk to your child or young person in a safe space for them and try not to make decisions based on initial um, discussions, maybe chat more to the school, have an informal chat to try and find out what's at the root of it. And then work with the school to come up with a plan that's going to help your child or young person go to school or college. Um, and important to have consistency and give them a sense of security and gives everybody a chance to look at what's happening, what's working in the plan and maybe what needs to be changed. And there's a link here for the emotionally based school avoidance guidance. Do you know what it links to, Marina? Because obviously we can't see that with, um, when, you know, without clicking on it. I've the, put one letter. It's um, emotionally based school avoidance. I'll see if I can open it here. And then I'll be able to just pop it in there. Has it come up? No, not at the moment. Oh, not, okay. not to worry. Maybe we can add that in at the end. Yeah. Okay, I, have... I can add that link. So the school will have an attendance policy and they must all have an attendance policy. And you should let the school know that your child is not going that day and give some reason why. And you might not want to leave everything on an aunt's phone, which is often the case when you're reporting an absence. It might be that you want to talk confidentially to a member of staff at some stage. But if you can say if you're taking them to the GP or whether there's an appointment, either in that phone call or in the conversation com more confidentially, and how long you expect your child to be absent from school, and what's the pro prognosis for recovery. So it might be chicken pox, might be tonsillitis, or it might, might be something more serious. So if you're able to leave some indication of that, it might be that you agree with the school that you don't have to ring every day. It depends on the nature of the illness um, for those longer conditions and the evidence that's provided. So unless schools have got a real uh, genuine concern about the gen how genuine that absence is, they shouldn't be asking for medical evidence. Um, if there's a history of absence, they, they might be asking for that. And they can record the absence as, as unauthorised if they're not satisfied about the genuine nature of that absence. So otherwise, they should be um, making it an authorised absence on the register and working with you, listening to you and making a plan, as we've discussed. I've put the inclusion support service contact details here. Um, if there are difficulties, and particularly if there are medical conditions or exclusions that are coming along and the, the absence is continuing, if you contact Jonathan Wilcox at the inclusion support service, they can sometimes get involved and, and work with the school and yourselves to resolve the the, the difficulties at an earlier stage. So then, you know, what are you already doing to support your child? Um, really important to listen to what they've got to say and validate it. 
um, keeping calm, giving those strategies the chance to work that you discussed with the school or even at home before you've got to that point, recognising the small steps to achievement. For some children, it's literally going in the school, uh, going to the school in the car and looking at the school and then going home. Sometimes that's the first step. And the next one would be getting out and saying hello to a member of staff at the door if it's that level of anxiety, perhaps that's stopping your child from attending. Um, support child's learning. The routines are really important. If you can mirror those, getting up, getting dressed, if your child's mental health is allowing you to do that or general health. Um, and there is a link in here as well, Sarah, to some guidance about promoting good attendance habits the parents and carers that's on the Hampshire website. So evidence for absence, authorised absence. So mental and physical illness should be recorded as I for illness unless there's the uh, concern. I said A earlier, I for illness. And they shouldn't be requesting evidence unless there is a history of absence that's unexplained or they've got cause to be concerned. But evidence can be uh, evidence of health appointments with the GP, any professionals, it might be a paediatrician, it might be CAMS, um, any other clinics, I, I suppose. Um, and your school should know if your child has got medical needs. And if they've got a disability, we've talked about the reasonable adjustments. So the diagnosis, if you've got that, that you can share. And you don't have to send your school child to school if they're unwell. And on, uh, authorised absence due to illness cannot result in legal action. So what's the school doing to support you and your child? Are they involving you at an early stage to talk about the non-attendance and address the barriers that you have identified? Have they considered using mentors in the school? Um, some schools use ACE mentors or ELSA or other pastoral staff. And are they anticipating difficulties what, rather than waiting for them to happen? Is it a proactive process where they're thinking, well, this might be a difficulty, so let's try putting this in place. And have they signposted you to other organisations that might offer support, such as CAMS, the Early Help Hub, um, Autism Hampshire, quite often a, a useful source for some parents. And any actions should be discussed and reviewed together with you. In this slide, I've put the emotionally based uh, school avoidance guidance again, the mental health and behaviour in schools guidance and the Hampshire policy for supporting pupils at school with medical conditions. So if your child is going to be out of school for more than 15 days, then the, the local authority have got a legal duty to start looking at putting provision in place under the um, Education Act. Uh, it's a bit tricky because it says that there's no legal deadline by which they start to provide it, but it should be as soon as it's clear that the absence will be for more than 15 days and should be no later than um, the sixth day of the absence. So aiming to do so from the first day, but they need to liaise with the appropriate medical professionals to avoid delay and to put appropriate provision in place. Also, the nature of the reason that the child is absent needs to be considered because it may not be appropriate that full-time provision is put in place. It might need to be part-time because that's all the child can manage at that time. So the school's attendance representative or officer should jointly work with 
the parents and the students to engage them and create the plan. And it should include school-based activities or suggested refer uh, referrals to community supports or both. So th this, this is really crucial. If your child isn't attending school, we strongly advise that you keep a diary of all correspondence and dates of appointments. Just get a notebook, jot down any dates of appointments as, as in date order if you can, um, with any health professionals, any other professionals um, that are involved, for instance, occupational therapy, the GP, and any actions that come from that make contact with us and keep a note of the, the date that you called and any actions we've advised. Keep dates of meetings with schools and um, notes of any actions agreed. And those might be in form of an email, but as long as you've got access to those. Um, and any meetings in person or virtually. <clears throat> also, uh, contact with the local authority SEN team if you're working with them uh, for additional provision of support, for instance, or change of placement, or the inclusion support service. Um, and making a note of any websites that you've researched so to try and find strategies to support you. What you are trying to prove is that you're not complicit in your child's non-attendance. But don't forget, if if there's not good reason for schools to be concerned about the non-attendance, this shouldn't matter so much, but it's a good backup to have anyway. So other sources of, uh, sources of support are the Not Fine in School Facebook support group, and we've got some of their uh, support materials on our website, and you might want to make use of those. Possible referrals to CAMS. Um, schools will normally have a view of what's going on there, and you would write your view from home if it's around anxiety. And the Hampshire Parent Care, Care Network as well will have uh, information, and hopefully this will be on the website too, so that you can refer to this. So then this is the bit where parents come to us and they're, they're concerned because legal action has been threatened and there are different types of legal action that can be put in place. This follows a lot of work with the school, looking at strategy, seeing what's working. So, so it's not leaping to it very quickly. So a parenting order might be um, put in place, meaning that you'd have to go to parenting classes and you'll have to do what the court says to improve your child's school attendance. An education supervision order can be put in place and um, a supervisor will help you. There are meetings such as education planning meetings with the school to think about strategies that might work to encourage your child in school. If it's around anxiety-based um, non-attendance, but there's not enough evidence, that, that's a really tricky one, gathering the evidence, which is why keeping a record of all those meetings is important if there's not something like a diagnosis. Um, a school attendance order, if the court or the council thinks that your child's not getting an education, um, you have 15 days to provide evidence that you've registered your child in a school or that you're home educating. And if you don't, you could be prosecuted or given a fine. So the fine is sometimes known as a penalty notice, and each parent can be given a fine of £60, which rises to £120 if you don't pay within the 21 days. And if you don't pay after the 28 days, then you could be uh, prosecuted or the, or the uh, fine is, um, the, with, the notice is withdrawn. 
There's no statutory right of appeal once the notice has been issued. And the withdrawal of the notice only happens in very limited circumstances. Um, for instance, if it's sent to the wrong person or issued an error. And the notice must still be paid even if your child returns to school. If you pay the fine and your child continues to have unsatisfactory notice, prosecution and the magistrate's call to the education supervision order under section 36 will be considered for the period not covered by the penalty notice. So the PACE meeting is held when the attendance is not satisfactory and the local authority must decide whether to progress to statutory action. And you will have the chance to state why your child has not attended school regularly and anything you might rely on in court as a defence or mitigating factors. And you may have evidence um, that you haven't already submitted. I'll have a slide in a moment, but if you've got evidence that hasn't been seen, you can write to the investigating officer on the letter that you receive if, if we get that far. So we'll talk about that in a moment. So the access and engagement service will be um, arranging, well, they'll be present at the meeting and school staff and anyone else that's able to contribute to the discussion. And they will also discuss and be advised on what will happen if the attendance doesn't improve. chair of the meeting, normally the access and engagement manager, will explain the two types of court action that are possible. So <clears throat> it might be, excuse me, <coughs> that the child's attendance continues to be unsatisfactory and the court action will be taken if the fine isn't paid within the time limit. So then the education supervision order can be made. Um, it gives directions to the supervised child and the parent to ensure that the child receives a suitable, efficient full-time education suitable for the age, ability and aptitude and special educational needs that he may or may, she may or not have. These directions must be defined by the local authority and should aim to be helpful in bringing about an improvement in the attendance. And the LA could direct the child and parent to attend meetings at the school over a period of the order and require the child and the parent to keep the LA informed of their address or require them to attend parenting lessons or classes. If the parent can persistently fails to comply with directions given by the supervisor, they might be guilty of a criminal offence and then go back to court. And if a child persistently fails to comply, the supervisor is obliged to refer the matter to social services who will then have to investigate. So, Either alternatively or in addition to the education supervision order, the local authority can bring prim criminal proceedings under the 1996 Education Act when it's deemed that the parent is failing to ensure the regular attendance of the child. And there's a more serious offence um, for failing to send the child to school with a maximum fine of two and a half thousand pounds and imprisonment for up to three months. And the higher penalty applies to parents who know their child is failing to attend regularly at school, but still take no reasonable action to ensure their child attends. So it's not meant to frighten everybody, but it is there in extreme circumstances. So the Access and Engagement Service will act in accordance with the spirit of the codes of practice and the, and the PACE meetings, ensuring that the parent understands the basis for the interview and ensure that their needs are taken into account and that their rights are explained and that the interviews are conducted fairly. 
and the access and engagement um, service will be able to answer any questions that you have at the and the PACE meeting is an opportunity for those to be discussed there. So if you receive a call to order or, or are threatened with one and believe that there are genuine reasons for your child's non-attendance at, at school, you can contact us and, and we can advise you. But the main thing is that you do contact the parent, uh, pupil entitlement investigating officer with your evidence and <clears throat> the contact details will be on the form that you've received. <coughs> your evidence will be re uh, reviewed and the process can be halted if good reason is agreed. And last month this actually happened in a case that I had. Um, the parent hadn't realised that she had as much evidence as she, as she actually did have. And when she shared it with me, we talked about sharing it with the investigating officer. And the result was that school actually put much more support in place. An EHCP was requested and the case was dropped. So it was a really fantastic result because there was good reason. And there was reason also for the school to have thought there might not be justification for the absence um, without sharing the circumstances. It, it was it was reasonable that they'd taken that step in the first place in light of what happened next. So there is a, a plea charge that looks like this and it would have your details on there. And there's um, a review of materials and case preparation that's also £150 there that would have to be paid as well. If you're told that you'll be issued with an attendance order and your child has already got an EHCP, you might want to ask that their, their needs, are, special educational needs and disabilities are reviewed um, with a full reassessment, which would go through an annual review, uh, because maybe they are some new reports that have come to light. It might be that the anxiety, uh, anxiety has not been included within the EHCP, but you would need to do this urgently, request this urgently because you'll have 15 days to respond. So that's a, a whiz through, Sarah. Shall I stop sharing? Stop sharing it just makes everything a bit bigger doesn't it right i've got um a few questions coming in as you can imagine um so when your child is not getting the full support from their ehcp and their anxiety gets so bad that you keep them home and let their school know that they're having a mental health day due to anxiety can the school put it down as unauthorized Again, that goes back to the evidence and you know what, what you've been doing to support the um attendance. If it's if it's been going on for some time, you know, have have has the GP been contacted? Have there been appointments? Have CAMs been um consulted? Have the school tried everything so far in terms of the emotionally ba based um support that they can give? This sounds like a one off a one off day. So, I mean, if, if, it, if it's, you know, it, a young person who largely is managing to get themselves into school, but every now and then just needs some headspace. I think that that it would depend how often that was. If it was a one off, then you'd still be having high attendance, wouldn't you? It's only when the attendance starts to drop or there's a pattern of. But the, but the question from the parent is that particular day being marked as unauthorised as opposed to an I because you said it should have been you know if it's a health base it should be an I so the, the question from the parent is, is is can that be marked as unauthorised if it was like if the child's attendance was uh, around 95 percent normally and there weren't yeah. any questions I don't I can't speak for the school but I wouldn't have thought they would be okay. being concerned it's when the attendance like that pattern or where it's dropped then they might be asking questions. 
I'd also, the parent would be explaining what they'd already tried, but if they needed a mental health day, what's going wrong for it to already be at a level where they're not able to attend school? Okay. Another one on a, a similar theme. I think they're all on a similar theme. I'm interested to know why a school can, can unauthorise absent um, when a child, when a parent keeps a school off due to a safe to safeguarding schools, the, pose, the, the school posing a safeguarding risk to the child and how the school are not held accountable when they neglect or refuse to send work home when requested by the parents so the child doesn't miss out. So there's two questions there. One, one is going back again to, to the, how, how the school um, reports something when, when, when a parent is reporting that a child isn't coming to school because of their mental health. And the other is at what point the school um, can be held accountable for sending work home, which I think you said was an absence of more than 15 days, was it? it, it well, it did originally, uh, to start with, you should discuss with them whether they will start giving the work sooner. And again, it's how able the child is to engage with that learning at that point, depending on what level of anxiety, for instance, and what the impact is going to be and who else is involved professionally. Um, so the safeguarding bit, Sarah, I wasn't quite sure what you said about the safeguarding. So the, the, the parents question is, um, why why is it okay why can a school um mark an absence as unauthorized when a parent is keeping a child off school due to safeguarding some concern i think in this instance they're effectively referring to mental health safeguarding so that by sending that child to school it is it is you know it's affecting their health and therefore it's a safeguarding issue but but they might not they they would only be writing unauthorized if there was like genuine concern about the veracity of the absence, I, well, I think the I think the parent is implying that that they are getting they are being given unauthorized absences if they're keeping their child off school due to their child's mental health. So that goes back to the evidence, doesn't it? If it's happening regularly, you know, what are the school putting in place already? Going back to that plan, what are they trying? What what are they saying to the parents? Um, is there any evidence there to support? Sometimes it might be that the unidentified needs, there might be some SEN needs that aren't identified that mean the child's anxiety has risen. So it's looking into all of that. It's a problem where it's recurring. If, if it's like one off, then it's not normally going to be unauthorized okay i've got a little bit more details about that specific situation and it, and it is quite a unique situation but i i it is a situation that i have heard from other parents within my get-togethers so the the school in question is a special needs school and the young person um had evidence of physical harm um and so the parent kept them at home because they were concerned about their safeguarding Right, so the, the child was harmed by a parent or a, a staff member, uh, not a parent, was harmed by a child. So I, and I, I have heard, you know, it sounds, I, I appreciate to some of you that, that may sound extreme, but I, I have heard similar scenarios at other get togethers. So in that scenario where a parent is keeping a child at home because they are concerned of their, their physical safety in school, how should that be recorded? Well, the evidence for that would be that you, if there's physical harm <clears throat> going on, you'll be communicating that with the local authority, I would have thought anyway, which would be evidence, wouldn't it? So if there's something serious enough for your child to raise, to be raising a safeguarding concern, that would be being looked into. It wouldn't be a straightforward, unauthorised absence. And I suppose what you're doing ultimately is you're putting together a... Um a portfolio of evidence aren't you um mm. as, as you're as you're going along yeah so uh, you know sometimes other children's behavior maybe that's where the harm's coming from if it's an allegation about staff member that's something else altogether um but always going back to what are the conversations going on with school if you're conversing with them and trying to work out a plan then they shouldn't be 
you know, there shouldn't be concern unless it's ongoing. But again, in that situation, the inclusion support service might be the people to go to. Jonathan Wilcox. I, I appreciate these. Uh, often these situations are very um, personally unique and it makes it terribly yeah. difficult for you to, yeah. to give us a generic a generic response. I appreciate that. <laughs> that is one, however, I have interestingly heard right. on a number of occasions. Mm. Um, right. What happens when your child is um, emotion, EBSA, Emotionally Based School Avoiding, but school do not give work home and just keep telling you to get your child into school? The local authority informs and they do nothing and don't reply to emails. Hampshire can't even allocate anyone to conduct a formal complaint at the moment due to the high demand. What can parents do? Well, again, I'd say that is the inclusion support service. Go to them because they do get involved where uh, there are medical issues for being absent and anxiety would be one of those and they they would liaise with the school in 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 some cases so that to to progress things they so the inclusion support service are part of the local authority but they do seem to be pretty effective in moving things forward and, they, and can they get involved with um things like work being sent home marina because you know obviously some of these young people you know they they are in a position where they could be learning if if that work was provided i think they'd want to know why why it wasn't being provided by the school what the school's reason was and I, but i do think it's important that the parent will have had those conversations and have maybe some understanding of what the school is saying or are they just being intransigent they they won't budge on sending work home so if they can if the parent could be ready to say what the conversation with the school has been that's already taken place that would be a helpful start before they would likely get involved so just following on from that i've, I've got a comment from somebody saying um, the school feel work set at home will encourage the child to stay at home Yeah, so there's is sometimes it's like that, isn't it? And the school won't budge, and the parents saying well, the child can't go. Yeah, and I have had a case like that, and it's ongoing, and it's it's difficult. But if there is yeah. good reason for that child to be off school, and the school aren't doing it, then the inclusion support service would be where to go. Okay, another interesting one about work being sent home. What could be put in place if the child is unable to do the work sent home? What if they need more adult supervision to do it? Can you have a tutor come to the house? How would you instigate this? And I think that's a tricky one, particularly when we're talking about children who indeed are on EHCPs and potentially have at school additional support in order to yeah. take part in their learning, you know, and, and parents aren't in a position to provide mm. the level of additional support yeah. that is at so, school. So if they're off for a long period of time, it, well, after the 15 days, the local authority have a duty to put provision in place. The Section F has to be delivered because the EHCP is a legal document. And this is where um, the local authority refer to a bespoke package. So they can start looking at what support can go in place, but actually the school holds the funding so the school would be the first port call to put that provision in place. And if there were difficulties, then the local authority would potentially get involved. Um, and again, I spoke to the local authority about the case fairly recently about this. And there aren't extra pots of money, but the school holds that funding. So they would be the ones to be saying about maybe getting power tutors in or whoever the tutor company is, or sometimes there's different therapies that are put in place like equine therapy or some whatever it is that the child needs and the section F provision. If there's not an EHCP, then that's different and it would have to be looked at what could be put in place um so that that would be a discussion with the school so, so for a child with an ahcp the provision this is in section f 
should be provided if a child has been at home for more than 15 days it should be provided in a setting other than school they are well so alternative provision yeah it yeah. does need to be it does need to be moderated if it's illness it's got to be linked to how much they can cope with yeah and on, there was a slide wasn't there about this saying that um there's not an actual starting point but it's as soon as possible after the absence starts and certainly after the 15th day if it's going to be long term so schools would have to be looking at what's in your area and you know what will provide the section f can I just check, is it 15 days, as in three school weeks, three weeks of five days, or is it 15 days, as in 15 calendar days? It says 15 days, I think it's school days. Okay, so it's, it's effectively three weeks off school. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've got a couple of questions, which is sort of generic, really, mm. um, about CAMS and GP and other agency support. In reality, there's often no support possible mm. from anywhere mm. and or long waiting list and refusal to access. What are parents and students' rights while the support isn't provided? What, from CAMS? So, so if parents aren't getting the support they need to support their child or young person's mental health, um, which could therefore result in school refusal. What what can parents do to, you know, are there, are there other things that we can direct them to? Well, in some school areas, they've got the mental health support teams in schools, MSHTs, so um, MHSTs. So ask about those. And some schools have got their own internal other provision um, but that wouldn't be medical. So the, also the, the Hampshire CAMS website's got some useful information. If you Google Hampshire CAMS and scroll down, it's got a section for parents. And then you can look at all the different anxiety, I think is the top one, and click on them and it will give you some suggestions. But if a referral is made to CAMS, I mean, obviously it depends how urgent it is, but that, I mean, from our point of view, the GP and CAMS would be the way to go in the mental health, health teams in school. And can I, at that point, can I just signpost people if they're not aware of them to our FIM groups, our Future in Mind groups, which we have once a month now face-to-face -face all around the county in different places. We have CAMS practitioners come along to each of those every month. They're really good opportunity to to pose a question to a CAMS practitioner but also to meet other parents who might be in the same position as yourselves um good question about the 15 days I asked about 15 days is it calendar days or, or school days but is it in a row or if it was a child who'd been absent for 15 days over a period of time that's consecutive okay it's consecutive yep okay so at, that's the point at which we step in um looking for the so schools provide long term yeah. hmm. um generic question um when we're talking about contacting the local authority who is classed as the local authority apart from the local apart from the inclusion support service well if you your caseworker and possibly a manager so depending on um if you're going through an annual review because they're unmet needs or they're not making progress you might be asking for a change of placement in some cases, you know, the, the child's needs might have meant that special school placement is, is needed. So if there's local authority, not everybody's going to be contacting the local authority, but starting with the caseworker or the inclusion support service. So I, th I think when we're talking about the local authority, Marina, we're talking about the local education authority, aren't we? Yeah, the education. That's what we're talking about. So we're talking about the local education authority, which for most of us here, I would assume, is Hampshire. There are other services that do fall under the local the local authority, though, aren't there? Which which might be relevant here. Social services is one of them. Mm. Um, so, um, in the does the inclusion support for service fall under education, or is it a separate? Yeah, sorry, it's education. But yeah. you've made a good point there about social care as well. If you've got social care involvement that that could be very useful as well 
And of course, the other service that, that, that is relevant within an EHCP, but, but is a separate entity is the NHS, because um, although some therapy and provision that are provided directly through the education authority. So I think when we talk about the local authority to that, just answering that question, because I think quite often we almost slip into jargon and we say that's when you get in touch with the local authority. What we tend to yeah. mean is the local education authority. Educational, you're right. Yeah. And, and the SEN team in particular, if your child has an EHCP, if they don't have an EHCP, then you would be going to the inclusion support service because you won't have a caseworker. Super. I've just got a question that goes back a little bit to what you were saying about Section F. Um, and I think it, it, I think you've sort of answered it, but I shall read it out anyway. Um, when we're talking about provision after those 15 days, would that include social skills groups, emotional regulation help that you'd normally get from an ALSA? How could that be provided at home? Well, that's the, that's the tricky thing, isn't it? Is looking at the package that could be put into place. You no, know, it, it, sometimes it might be that a child could have that provision, some of the provision in school and some at home. You know, if were they able to go in and have a session with the ELSA at school, can they have can they manage that? So it, it could be, it doesn't have to be necessarily all out of uh, at home based. And also not all parents want it to be at home again, depending on the nature of the absence. You know, could it be in a community central you know safe space that's um okay to deliver that with a tutor perhaps so it really is quite dependent on the situation um just got one more question come in but before we do that can you just give a little pitch for sendias for those people who perhaps haven't come into contact with sendias before and what what you do and when parents can get in touch with you well if you've got any questions about the education side of things, and we can signpost to social care and health as well. And our website's got, we cover a lot of topics on our website, if you want to use that as the first point of call, or call our um, helpline on, I, we can put- I'll find, I've got it for you, I'll find it. <laughs> call our helpline and just talk to one of us, um, about your concerns and then they will start with that and we quite it sometimes takes a while to get to the nub of what's going on because it seems like one thing and then it turns out it could be three or four others within so you know we're there to have that conversation and something we've recently put in place is you can book an appointment to chat to one of us for about an hour and there are different times some of them are later in the day Mine are on a, on a Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Um, and then you can talk it through, but you know what time you need to be available then, which is quite helpful for some parents. If you have to pin down a time, we will try and call you within that time frame that you've, you've given us. But you can certainly email us as well on the info at hampshiresendias.co.uk. And we'll email you back and you can give us your phone number but we, we cover all sorts of topics such as um bullying um ehcps getting uh, how to apply for an ehcp and the whole process through to tribunals there's so much on there and I know parents at my get togethers really value the input, Marina. And I think it's 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 not only having somebody who's so knowledgeable, but I think sometimes somebody who's a step removed from it and and can look at the situation and and you know with with fresh eyes. And I know sometimes um also sometimes such situations people attend meetings with somebody, and I think you know mm. it's so emotive for parents. I think it's really important sometimes to have that support. It's a, you know it's really good stuff that you do, and it's really important. You what you said there, Sarah. We're impartial. We're not on any one side. We we are just giving the facts, and you know sometimes the questions in these kind of meetings are very, so unique to a situation. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what what should happen. But our job is to refer to the law as well and to be just saying what the law is around your questions 
and what the school should be doing. And we'll help you prepare for meetings. And there are criteria for more intensive support with a caseworker. Um, and, and we would send you that to ask you those questions if you called to see if, if we could allocate a caseworker. Our um, call ratio has just gone up immensely and we're doing all we can to manage all our casework so that we can support those that need that. But also it's really important that we empower parents to advocate for themselves so we can give them the advice and the information and we can step by step talk them through how to do something without a caseworker. And those bookable slots are really helpful in doing that. That's already started to have an impact. And we've just started doing those in the last couple of months. And there's also um, we've done we've been doing these sessions now, um, I think, for nearly two years. So there's, there's mm. sessions like this that are recorded going back on both the HPC and um, YouTube channel and the Hampshire mm. Care, Parent Care Network channel both the Sendias and the HPCN, sorry. And so there's there's information out there. I know, and that's something I know I say in sessions very often that uh, that parents, you know, just having to find information is exhausting, but there, there is there is information out there. And um, as well as our Future in Mind sessions, we also do monthly get togethers, which again are back to being face to face around the country. Mm -hmm. And it's, it can be really useful to just um, come and share with another parent your experiences and often there's another parent there who's had a similar experience who even if they can't offer you solutions and advice they they can they can empathize and I, I think people find that really really valuable something um, else we've started just this month Sarah is um our clinics at those get-togethers yes so yeah. we're going to go and give the parents an opportunity to come talk to us one-to-one -one at those meetings and there is we also do um there are i think still two virtual get togethers so if you can't get to we are aware that you know not everybody can get out to a meeting and not everybody can make a meeting in what is the school day so there is also an evening get together online on zoom and one and one on the daytime as well hmm. i have put quite a lot of links as we've been going along into the chat um you can save those links. Now I'm on a laptop. On a laptop, um, by my chat bar, there's three little dots to the top right. And if you click on there, you can save the chat. Um, it, it, I'm not sure entirely how it works on tablets and bits and pieces like that, but there should be a way of you saving those links so that you can keep that information if you want to. If you watch the um, recording back, those I think those chat bits actually pop up on the side as well. Okay, I think we've covered all the questions that I've got there. It's clearly an emotive situation and topic and one that people have very specific yes. scenarios with. Um, I hope it's been useful for those of you that have attended. Marina, thank you very much for your You're time. Shall I um, leave you to it now then? Lee, you can leave me to it. I will, we will, I will uh, I've, I've got just two comments coming back for you there, Marina. It's, I think oh. it's nice for you to get the feedback. Thank you to, thank you both. It, thank you, it's been really helpful. So I think, you know, I think, I think, it, think it's great that you know it, it it is positive um okay everybody it's been lovely to see you all this morning i hope you have a good and positive rest of the day and we hope to see you at an, another event somewhere soon the recording will go up sometime in the next couple of days take care all bye